Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth in the JCU COVID-19 webinar series. Tonight, we are looking at uh, the impact of COVID in pregnancy and the newborn. Um, I would like to acknowledge all the traditional owners of the people of the lands in which we will meet tonight across the state and beyond. And just to summarize a little bit of what we're going to go through tonight, what we're going to be covering tonight is there have been lots and lots of questions that have come in and we have tried to categorize them into three or four particular um, areas. The first one is the the prenatal about whether or not it's safe to fall pregnant during this time, then antenatal around safety uh, for the baby, but also for usual care, antenatal care. The um, third category is intrapartum care. You know, can partners be in the room? How do healthcare staff uh, look after themselves? And then um, once the baby's delivered, who can come in and um, visit and so on? Then finally, the, the newborn, which is um, yoga speciality. So I think we're going to give David a try. So David, can you hear me now? Thank, thank you very much. I, I think it's fair to say that the final word on uh, the effect of pregnancy on uh, COVID and the COVID effect on pregnancy, the final word that hasn't been written yet. Um, it's a rapidly changing uh, area. And um, it's interesting when you're looking through the publications, some of the publications that are available online before publication are already out of date for the time that the, uh, the journals are published. Um, so it's true to say what's true today might not be true tomorrow. Um, it's different to other, other recognised viral infections that we're very familiar with managing in pregnancy, such as cytomegalovirus, hepatitis C, or uh, even things like uh, influenza A. Um, it's true that immunologically, Pregnant women have a slightly altered uh, immunological response, but you have to say that the vast majority of women are extremely immunocompetent. Um, but there is a slight T1, T2 alteration favoring immunosuppression with dampening of T1 and uh, 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 increase in uh, T2 function. But uh, you don't necessarily get predisposed to infection. I think you're just predisposed to severe infection in certain conditions, such as gonococcal infection infections in pregnancy, and the classical one is influenza A, the H1N1 epidemics of uh, uh, 1918 and 2009. Um, if you look at that, the, the, the way pregnant women behaved in those, in those epidemics, uh, there's a very nice review article in the, in the American Journal in 2000, American Journal of OMG in 2012, summarizing influenza in pregnancy. Um, and in say in 2018, 40 to 50% of the deaths recorded in some New York, in some American hospitals were in pregnancy. Similar thing happened in, uh, not to that degree though, with influenza A, uh, H1N1 in 2009. It uh, was estimated that 1% of the American population were pregnant at the time, but it made up 5% uh, of the uh, maternal deaths. Um, I was gonna go through some of the, what happens with the reported series with COVID in pregnancy, COVID-19 in pregnancy, uh, go through a couple of case reports, look at uh, some nice guidelines, and the Royal College have a nice guideline that's useful, how to manage severe disease, talk about vertical transmission, transmission and then that uh, difficult topic of asymptomatic or a word I've never really heard of until now, pre-symptomatic disease. Next slide, thanks. Um, this is uh, probably the largest series of pregnant women uh, who've had COVID-19 from China. And it's interesting that uh, the pregnant women represented less than 1% of all COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID cases reported in this time frame. Typically, the symptoms of fever and cough were the two commonest, and more than 80% of them had infiltrates on chest CT. Um, the purpose of this slide is just to talk about how many women had mild versus severe or, severe or critical disease. And you see the vast majority had mild disease. We, we, we talk about mild disease, but these women are still sick. Mild disease, well and truly the commonest uh, uh, severity in this in this group. Um, severe disease, with over ninety percent severe severe or critical disease, making up about ten percent of patients. Uh, like in like influenza A, majority of infections are in the third trimester, and in this series, not all the women have delivered. Uh, next slide, thanks. Similar um, to a report in New York from a similar time. 
and I haven't put the slide up, but there's also a, a, a systematic review in the American Journal of Allergy talking about 51 women who actually were symptomatic with COVID um, and the uh, distribution of mild, severe or critical disease is very similar. So 80 to 90% are mild disease. And that contrasts with the population, uh, with similar trends in the population. Uh, next slide, thanks. So going back to the, the uh, New England Journal, 118 women with COVID, um, 68 of those patients have delivered. And the take home message from this and the American College, the American Journal uh, Meta-Analysis, sorry, Systematic Review, says that the, the uh, in summary, that have very high cesarean section rates, 93% uh, in China, it was 96% in the, uh, in the uh, American report. Um, the, uh, in the, this Chinese review, uh, the majority of cesarean sections were due to concerns about COVID to affect the pregnancy. And uh, that's not spelled out exactly what that means, but I think the high cesarean section rate, the high preterm delivery rate, uh, just represents a, a group of women who are sick. Uh, next slide, thanks. The summary of uh, from these the two large studies suggests that the, the risks are similar maternally to the non-pregnant population. The obs specific obstetric risks are increased preterm birth and cesarean sections. And the neonatal risk is predominantly preterm delivery with no good evidence of vertical transmission. This virus doesn't, depend, doesn't appear to have a, uh, a high rate of maternal viremia, so it doesn't appear to have a vertical transmission, a significant vertical transmission rate. Uh, next slide, thanks. David, David, just before you go to the next slide, could we, could we just stick, Pamela, could we go back to that? And if, if it's sitting in general practice, if we have women or couples come in and ask us, uh, they might be planning a pregnancy or thinking about it. What, what kind of advice based on the evidence that we have at the minute could we give them? Uh, I'd, I'd say this, if, if they were to get infected with the virus, it's, it's the majority of women are mildly infected, but mild infection doesn't mean you're not sick. They can be quite sick and incapacitated, but the the, the maternal risks are not great. There are certainly reports of um, severe disease requiring ventilation, um, uh, significant risk of preterm birth, and that's implications. The, uh, the American Systematic Review did report two stillbirths, which is a pretty high, pretty high perinatal death rate of four percent, but that wasn't the case in China. So there, there are there are maternal and fetal risks, but the majority of women come through it fine. Um, the a lot of women will be worried about the risks of fetal infection and adverse. Uh, outcome to the fetus, uh, outcome to their baby. Fetal risks, risks are low, but it doesn't mean you're going to escape adverse pregnancy outcomes such as preterm birth or preterm delivery. Thank you. And um, finally, the other question I wanted to ask is when you say preterm delivery, how preterm, uh, what's the range at the moment that we know from, from what we can tell? It's all coming out the American systematic review, median birth, median birth uh, sorry, gestation of birth was 36.3 weeks. So it's, it's, it seems to be late preterm. Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it a little bit later about the indications for the delivery, um, but I think we'd, we'd you know, you'd really want to see. I think there are some indications to deliver once you get to 28 weeks with failing respiratory function, but before that, I think we'd try and individualise delivery. And sorry, Dave, uh, the questions are coming in fast and furious. Um, is, are you aware that there might be any evidence that women have been co coerced into early induction to get them in and out quickly in the US rather than they were sick and therefore they, they were induced earlier or they had a section earlier? That's not clear, but I, I, it's not clear from, that sort of detail isn't clear from the reports. But, but I, I come back and we had, had this experience with swine flu. I think these women are sick. And I think if you've got uh, progressive deteriorating lung function or concerns about fetal well-being, I think we tend to deliver early. I think we would, we would uh, be especially keen to deliver someone who wasn't getting better quickly because of the uh, sort of very long time it takes to get a, 
and operative delivery ready with PPE. Thank you. The other fine print thing just to say is that a lot of, most of the reports are in the third trimester that people are being delivered because they're sick. There are first and second trimester uh, women being infected and what is the vertical transmission in first and the second trimester? What is the growth restriction rate for women whose pregnancy continues after this? That, that data is not in yet. It's really only women who are mainly sick in the third trimester who are delivered who we have information on. So the same similar sort of thing with the cytomegalovirus. If you had cytomegalovirus in the, th in the third trimester, well, you're not going to see many and deliver quickly. You're not going to see many babies infected. It's a completely different story if you catch cytomegalovirus in the first and second trimester. Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, th these are just two contrasting reports of how the first cases of uh, uh, COVID-19 were managed firstly in the US and then the recent publication of Australia. So 34 year old comes in with classical symptoms, um, patients donned with a surgical mask when she presents, droplet and contact precautions undertaken, the staff wore PPE. Uh, an assessment occurs and this is what we would try and do, is delivery imminent? No. Is delivery indicated? No. So an assessment occurs to figure out whether you're mild, severe or critical. Um, it's basically based on what your uh, blood pressure, respiratory rate, less than 30 is good. Saturation, more than 70, more than 94% is good. Uh, it's crackles in the chest, which is in surprising. In the Chinese study, 80% of women, uh, whether they had mild or severe disease, had uh, pulmonary infiltrates. So this woman has mild disease. CTG is normal. Next slide, thanks. COVID test is done surprisingly it's negative. Um, but... Uh, she appears to have some viral disease, so she's managed as having COVID anyway. In labour two days later, repeat swab is, is actually COVID detected. Labour is allowed to continue, is, uh, is we're 30, we're in late, late third trimester, so labour is continuing. Continuous fetal monitoring is suggested. A normal delivery occurs. Skin to skin contact is not, is not allowed. There's no neonatal infection, but the baby is removed from the mother in a separate room until discharge formula feeding with, with uh, expressed breast milk, but no breastfeeding is allowed. Um, woman's kept isolated, contact is often by the phone to the room, and then um, mother and baby discharged on day six. Next slide, thanks. So this is contrasted with uh, the first case, in, first case in Australia, which is on the Gold Coast, recently in the Australian Journal of ONG. Um, actually that um, second line shouldn't be there. Um, so this is a 40-week um, woman in her first pregnancy, presents with symptoms, swabbed as detected with COVID. Um, next day is in labour, um, is managed in an isolation room. Uh, to prevent a long labour that's um, a potential long latent phase that is time consuming and especially resource consuming, uh, I think that's why an ARM and Centosinon were commenced immediately to shorten the labour. Continuous monitoring with the CDG. Next slide, thanks. And an early epidural to avoid having to do a general anaesthetic in a rush. Maternal monitoring occurs in labour, including oxygen saturations. The patient and the staff had an NP95 uh, mask. Um, <clears throat> fever develops in labour. So just remember, not all infections are due to uh, COVID-19, there could be other causes of fever, and this uh, woman's marriage is having chorioamnitis. An abnormal CDG presents pre um, precipitates an instrumental delivery. Baby doesn't need resuscitation, but certainly would have had a metabolic acidosis and needed to be delivered. In this, in this case, on the Gold Coast, the baby was not separated from mother. Breastfeeding occurs, mother and baby discharged on day four. Baby was screened for COVID and was negative on at 24 hours. And then the mother um, breastfeeds using, at, uh, wears a surgical mask at home for 10 days until the 14 days are over. Next slide, thanks. That's really how I think we would run it here in Townsville, the, 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 the second approach more than the first one. Um, it's, it's amazing that the, the contrast in the two different approaches in, at, at about the same time frame. Uh, this, this is a useful... Um, uh, guideline if you wanted to have some resources about what to do with uh, managing COVID-19 infections in pregnancy and this is when you read the Queensland Health Guideline I think it's heavily based on this. Next slide thanks. 
um, give some uh, information, some guidelines about uh, service delivery and also some advice about intrapartum management. Um, much, the, much as happens in the cases when intrapartum we assess maternal severity, continuous fetal monitoring, um, fever may have another cause in labour. Um, an operative delivery such as cesarean section is really for obstetric indications. Um, remember uh, personal protection equipment uh, at time of seizures is time consuming. And, you know, I think just we don't want to leave it until we need to do everything in a big rush in labour. So I think we need to be a few steps ahead of ourselves. Um, analgesia, Entinox is okay with a filter, although some Australian hospitals are not using Entinox even with a filter. Regional anaesthetic is okay. And just remember the VTE, the, the venous thromboembolic risk. Next slide, thanks. Uh, Dave, just before we go over to the next slide, a couple of questions to ask. Pamela, can we go before? Um, I can't recall if, you, if you're going to go through this a bit later. As you know, there is this increased um, a VTE risk with COVID that appears at severely ill patients with COVID. Do you have any comment about that in pregnancy? Have we got any information coming through on that? And that's, that's number one on the question. And number two is, as you know, we've got a lot of smaller uh, regional rural sites who do deliver. Um, what Would this be the same advice for them, the, the delivery, or would your, if it was possible, would your advice be to get the mom who is COVID positive to a bigger center to deliver? So sorry, two completely separate questions, one on BTE and one on remote. Uh, the, um, it, it's always difficult using venous thromboembolism prophylaxis with heparin or claxane pre-delivery because you will get caught with someone who needs a, a, a delivery uh, much sooner than the time that the claxane will wear off. <clears throat> someone needs to just uh, happy to give a regional block at 12, but most people want 24 hours after the last dose of claxane. And so you need to be careful that you don't uh, hinder your operative delivery anaesthetic and risk by using a prophylactic medication to prevent venous thromboembolism. So that's the one caveat. I was a bit anxious about using it. So, um, but, it, but it is recommended that if delivery is not thought to be required in the next 12 hours, it should be something that should, should be considered. I can't tell you what, I don't think the number is known, what the risk of venous thromboembolism is in uh, this younger, typically age group, mothers with mild disease. Um, where should that be managed, I think? I think a larger centre will probably have more resources um, than the smaller centre. So I would think in our, in our region, I, I would think the smaller hospitals will send them to us. Someone who's, someone who's sick will come to a larger centre, irrespective of the cause, would be my... That's what we've always usually done. Thank you. Um, our next slide, thanks. Um, the, uh, this is the Rural College Guideline. Um, if someone is severely unwell, and this is what we would do, a multidisciplinary team assessment with everyone who's likely to get involved, obstetrics, anaesthetics, ICU and infectious diseases, where should care be um, given? Um, it really depends what the symptoms are, whether it's more a respiratory failure, you probably need to be in a ICU. If it's more an obstetric problem, you probably will need to be managed in, in, in the maternity ward or the labour ward. Uh, hourly observations for decompensation. And just remember that uh, it makes the point that young fit women compensate very well till they suddenly decompensate quickly. Um, when do you decompensate? Um, it's really ox increasing oxygen requirements, um, inspired oxygen concentration more than 40%, rate more than 30 breaths per minute, and uh, failing to keep oxygen saturations above 94%. I think it's the rule of fours with um, oxygen concentration. So room is 21%. One litre per minute increases your oxygen concentration by about 4%. So at four litres a minute is the other way to think of it. Four litres a minute is about 40% inspired oxygen. Four percent, uh, sorry, 4% uh, per litre, four litres a minute is 40%. Um, chest imaging, um, I think don't, don't be put off by doing a chest X-ray or CT if you think it's indicated. The dose of radiation even for a CT is way less than it's going to be thought to be significant to cause fetal harm. Next slide, thanks. Um, so uh, summary slide, 
Um, not all fevers due to COVID-19, not all hypoxia is due to pneumonia, remember, remember venous thrombolysis, typically chest pain with a sudden increase in oxygen requirements. Try not to uh, over hydrate. Um, we see this with women who are septic. We're pretty comfortable giving them 250 to 500 mils of fluid bolus. You're not going to cause too much harm with that. And uh, if that's not if that's not working, you might not be uh, fluid. You might not, not you might not be dry. You're actually uh, potentially developing fluid overload. And we talked about Klaxo. Next slide, thanks. So Dave, just before you go over, um, quite a lot of questions, as you know, came in beforehand and are coming in now about midwives in the labour room. They might be there for eight hours, uh, women breathing very heavily, particularly in the second stage. And the question is, should they be having, should they wear an N95 mask throughout labour? Um, and there's some, seems to be some contention about whether prolonged first stage exposure or second stage is considered to be the aerosol generating stage. What, what have you found out in your research on that? Um, the, uh, there's a very nice table in the Queensland Health Guideline, um, talks about PPE equipment by the type of care and uh, droplet surgical mask, so droplet transmission requiring a surgical mask or airborne, airborne aerosol dissemination requiring the high end um, uh, mask and it it goes through very nicely about who should be wearing what when um, and I think I think it's said that the primary midwife managing someone in labor should be in full PPE including the, including the industrial strength mask um, the other carers in labor and the partners should uh, said uh, they're okay to wear just a normal surgical mask um, but no, the primary midwife who's in there all the time should be in full PPE Thank you. And Yoga, could I maybe bring you in at this point? Um, this is really talking again to the rural remote. Um, Dave, could you could you mute just for this bit? Thank you. Um, if you have to get a severely unwell patient from remote into the centre, what kind of NICU support um, would be available with retrieval and so on? Say the mom is, is COVID positive, the baby's been delivered or is preterm. Well, um, we will use the current approach where um, I will probably link up with uh, uh, David Watson or his colleague and the attending doctor at the regional center. We'll have a teleconference hopefully before the baby is born and to decide the best plan should the mother have her baby there or should the mother be transferred, in utero transfer to Townsville? And as I, David mentioned earlier, if the mum is quite unwell, we, that would be the best option to transfer mother in, in utero transfer um, to Townsville where we can provide care for both baby, mother and baby. If that's not possible then, um, or it's a, there's no time, then we will um, then you know, guide the local team uh, as um, recommending the same um, precaution that the Queensland Health has set up with this table that David mentioned, uh, wearing um, airborne contact risks. Uh, if the baby has a risk of being born and needing resuscitation, then the recommendation is to wear full um, PPE, including um, the N95 mask um, for the team. Now, the baby, from the current evidence, is a contact and not uh, uh, having the disease, but still the recommendation is to wear full PPE. Thank you so much. If you could mute and then Dave, I'm going to ask you a question's come up, which I hadn't considered before, but do you think there's a case to be made to admit all pregnant women who are COVID positive, given the risk that they might get very ill and decompensate very quickly? What would your thoughts be on that? And as I read about it, the, the decompensation seems to occur 10 to 14 day mark but I think it, I think once we've made someone's presented once we've made the diagnosis if we're happy that they've got mild disease and there's no imminent reason to deliver them or they're not in labor I think I'd be trying to get them home I think I think we would perform an assessment and then I think we'd, we'd rather manage them at home and then they would come they would then know to come back 
if things are worsening, but I yeah. uh, would be my is what is what we typically do with influenza and other uh, viral type infections. And do you think that would be the case for rural remote, particularly very remote? Um, that, that, no, I think I think that those those people often stay. I think it'll be, right. Especially if we made the diagnosis, I think it would be hard for them to return. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Find somewhere to go once they're here. Mm. All right, there are lots of questions coming, but I'll let you get on, and then we'll maybe stop in a little bit for more questions. Uh, this is a quick slide about steroids. To, uh, a simple misprint. There should be SARS-CoV-2 in that first line. Um, the, uh, the CDC suggests don't give steroids. Um, um, oh, sorry, the, the, to avoid steroids um, because of increased mortality in influenza, um, but and, and also in, in SARS-CoV-2. Um, but I think in pregnancy, we'd say uh, there is a benefit if delivery is going to occur in the next week from 24 to 36 weeks. Um, but maternal steroids may delay viral clearance. Um, so I think that it's, it's an unknown area, but I think if we were seriously going to deliver someone between 24 and 33, and 33 weeks, six days, we would give maternal steroids. Um, there's been a trend recently to give steroids from 34 weeks zero to 36 six, and we do that. We don't delay delivery for it, but we still certainly do that. But the recommendation is if you get this, the American Congress of Biology say, I suggest that don't use them after 33 weeks, six days. And I think no, no one, or oh, it's very unusual to use steroids from 37 weeks onwards. And the important thing is don't delay delivery to give steroids if the mother's sick and don't use tocolysis to, deli to delay delivery if uh, the mother, or the, if, there's a, if there's an obstetric maternal or fetal indication to deliver. Next slide, thanks. Um, so the timing of delivery, most COVID will produce mild disease, not sick mother, but mild disease, and, and infection is not said to be an indication of delivery. Infection by itself, it's the consequences that you might want to deliver. Um, so the, the, uh, there's a consensus that if you're needing more than four litres of oxygen a minute, that's, a, that's the inspired oxygen concentration of 40% to maintain your saturations uh, above 94% and, and more than 28 weeks, that's a reasonable trigger to deliver. Less than that, I think you have to individualise it. Um, when you've got a sick mother in respiratory failure, they're not going to withstand labour, so I think you need to do a caesarean section. We talked about steroids. Magnesium sulphate would typically be given less than 30 weeks for neuroprotection, and I think that's fine to give, but there are a recommendation uh, on physiological grounds with a sick mother to give it as a slower infusion instead of the 20 minutes we give it give the four grams over two minutes now, I think we'd do, do it more slowly. Next slide, thanks. Dave, just before you go to the next slide, interesting question that's come up is about, do you think um, that patients, do we have any evidence that patients with hypertension in pregnancy or diabetes in pregnancy, either pre-existing or that's come on, are at greater risk of severe disease? A bad, sorry, you dropped out. Um, so do you, is there any evidence emerging that patients who are pregnant with hypertension or with diabetes are at increased risk of more severe disease? Uh, that, that's not clear. That's not clear. Um, what's not clear for me is whether the you know, angios, angiotensin uh, uh, receptor uh, issue, um, because the, you know, the virus uses that to gain ex access to the cell, is uh, increased in women on, or patients who are on ACE inhibitors or angioceptin receptin blocking agents, whether that increased concentration of that receptor is allowing is, is part of the pathogenesis. But I, I don't know whether that's true. In, I don't know whether that's true. We wouldn't be using those drugs in pregnancy, but I don't know whether those same diseases have the same implications in a young pregnant population. This is the a slide about uh, vertical transmission. And just the, the short answer is that uh, the COVID-19 doesn't appear to be a highly viremic virus, and it's not surprising it's not present in amniotic fluid, cord blood, immediate neonatal throat swabs, or breast milk. Um, in this Chinese study, all women had elective cesarean sections and didn't have ruptured membranes. Um, it's interesting, in separate studies, seem to report that vaginal secretions are typically negative for COVID-19, but it, the virus is detectable in feces. Next slide, thanks. Uh, and the fine print in that is that these are typically women 
who are delivering. Um, it's not clear if you catch it in the first or second trimester what the fetal transmission rate is. It might be completely different. Uh, so next, question, next issue is whether you should universally screen uh, for COVID-19 um, for women coming in for delivery. So this is uh, a series from New York in the middle of a severe uh, burden of disease. 215 women came to this hospital for delivery in this time frame. Uh, 1.9, so 2% had symptoms, um, but 13 to 14% had, were asymptomatic and were, were had COVID detected. So a huge burden of asymptomatic disease. Next slide, thanks. Um, some of the asymptomatic ones have this, as I said before, something I've never heard of until now called pre-symptomatic disease. Um, in this group, 10% of the asymptomatic ones develop symptomatic disease in the very short time they're admitted to hospital, which is two days mean time. Um, but uh, it, they, many more may have developed symptomatic disease as time went on. So heavy burden of asymptomatic disease in, in, a, in, a, in a pandemic with lots of cases around. It's, as I read about asymptomatic disease, it's hard to know how um, much of a transmission risk asymptomatic disease is. It's said to, uh, say in nursing homes, um, again from New York, that those studies sort of say it might be 50% of transmission comes from asymptomatic people. But I've read other series that say in the chain of um, tracing contacts of people with, who have, the, have the, the disease, there isn't much in the way of asymptomatic passage of the virus. But I think asymptomatic, asymptomatic disease might be a completely different story because things are always different in pregnancy someone panting and puffing in the second stage is asymptomatic might be a much higher risk of transmission to the staff than someone who's not, not in the second stage of labor. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, this is just a, a nice New England journal that talks about some of the treatments for mild to moderate COVID-19. Um, uh, makes the point, consider other infections. It's not always um, COVID-19 causing the symptoms. There are no proven treatments is the, is the take home line. Hydroxychloroquine plus minus erythromycin theoretically has some activity and you'll read some studies that say it's uh, effective and the mechanism to try or the, the, the output for whether something is effective is usually uh, either a shorter length of stay, reduced oxygen requirements or reduced viral transmission time. And there are conflicting studies about hydroxychloroquine, whether it does that. Um, certainly high dose hydroxychloroquine appears to be cardiotoxic uh, normal dose hydroxychloroquine is unclear. Next slide, thanks. Um, the antivirals, uh, um, the protease inhibitors or RNA polymerase inhibitors, uh, remdesivir um, uh, maybe reduces oxygen support. Uh, trials are awaited. Same with the protease inhibitors. It's not clear where, where these fit in. Um, immunomodulation, we talk about to suppress hyperinflation steroids. Uh, convalescent passive. The, the, these these are all possibilities, but they're just not, not being evaluated. We need we need a large clinical trials to work out whether they're helpful. Uh, next slide, thanks. I'm going to quickly run out of time and take all yoga's uh, time, but I just want to say, in summary, we talked about the risks on the left hand side. A bit about antenatal care. The one thing to mention about antenatal care, antenatal care is that we're probably going to change um, diabetes screening to reduce uh, the amount of time people are waiting for pathology labors, they have their two, two to three hours wait to have their glucose tolerance test to a one-step diabetes screen. If you're less than 4.6 on a fasting, you probably don't need more testing. If you're 5.1 or higher on a fasting when you've got gestational diabetes, that intermediate range probably needs a GTT. And I have to stress, that's for screening. I think if, if you've got someone who's pretty sure has got diabetes, they've got a very large baby with polyhydramnios um, or some other, your strong indication of diabetes, I think you should still do a definitive test, but that's, that's screening. Um, intrapartum, um, if you find COVID-19, it's not a reason to deliver. It depends on maternal and fetal. So maternal disease progression, gestational age and the fetal condition. Um, consider delivery if, if, if supportive management isn't working. Uh, mode of birth is really for obstetric indications. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, but if you've got an ill mother, you're probably going to need an operative delivery. 
Yeah. David, just before you do that, um, yoga, we hand over to yoga, there are some questions which I think would be pertinent to answer now. So um, would you include a COVID serology with an amnio at the moment when you were doing your torch serology? So would you add COVID in? Um, I, I think the, um, there is described the potential for placental insufficiency and I think there would be a risk of fetal growth restriction with um, uh, COVID in early pregnancy. Um, but I think it's not particularly a viremic virus. I think the, the effect on the placental function is due to a sick mother. So if they've had a well, a well mother, I don't think I'd be in any rush to do viral serology on, on a well mother. I don't, I don't think the COVID is going to have caused smallness. I think there are lots of other reasons for smallness besides that in a well mother. I think, I think I'd be wanting to see symptomatic disease. Um, Perhaps that's what the question was asking. If you're going to do a torch screen, then maybe you've got, you know, you've got concerns. I'm, I'm not sure that COVID serology is available. I don't know whether, I, I've not ever needed to order it. I don't know whether you can actually do it. My understanding is that it's very unreliable at the moment. So that might be answered. Then just a couple of quick questions. Um, do you, do you know, is there any data around whether an epidural spinal or GA for uh, caesarean section delivery would be better in the setting of moderate to severe COVID? I think the, the anaesthetic answer would be uh, the, the answer is regional anaesthetic, what's the question? <laughs> okay. Um, there are, there are a couple of well, so other questions, like do we know if many women have declined recommended care during the pandemic? We had spoken about this earlier, hadn't we? Yeah. Um, we um, certainly have women who decline, who decline care and uh, an occasional woman who free birth. I spent three or four hours in theatre last weekend back together. Um, but, um, they're, they're, they're uncommon and we've not had, we've not had the, the experience of women requesting that, or women doing that because of care, but not that I know of. And there's also a question around um, um, water births, that, that there seems to be perhaps a, a difference of advice where carers, for example, are helping elderly people shower and so on, where there's a lot of water, but um, that water birds have been on not going ahead in some sites. Do, you, do, do we have any evidence around that? Well, theoretically, um, I think someone with, or, or I, uh, I did ask uh, them in delivery suite today that they still do water births in Townsville at the moment. If you had COVID, I think you wouldn't have a water birth. I think the main issue is that personal protective equipment is not waterproof. Um, and it's the Royal College to say, make, make a specific point about saying it in their guideline, although there is not demonstrated viral particles in vaginal secretions, it's well recognised present in faeces, so it's particularly going to, potentially going to be um, virus in the water. So the recommendation is, is if, you've got, if you've got the disease, you shouldn't have a water birth. But I think other women who are well are having it if they wanted it. Thank you. And I think you did answer this, there was a question early on about whether if the patient is COVID positive with the woman, would you we ask her to wear a surgical mask? But it seems to me that everyone else is in full kit, then, then it would be quite a difficult thing for a labouring woman to wear a mask all the time. Yes, the, the, the recommendation is they do wear an industrial strength mask. Gosh, I didn't know that. So everyone's in full PPE and the woman wears a mask. Yes, huh. as is suggested on the Queensland Health Guideline. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dave. We'll get you to mute and we'll hand over to Yoga. The coronavirus infection in infants um, is not a new condition. It's um, recognized from other types, other family members of the coronavirus as this uh, slide shows. This is an article by uh, Professor Nigel Curtis from Melbourne who divides them into four different groups and, um, and some of them have uh, been there for some time and it's recognized cause of childhood illness. Um, quite, uh, just want to focus on the COVID-19 box on the right, bottom right, which shows that um, based on the experience in China, they published a fairly large uh, series in pediatrics uh, um, with um, uh, the experience 
uh, across the ages, uh, which shows that um, relative to adult, the number of children who get this infection is smaller. Um, in that particular series in pediatrics, they had one death from a 14 year old. So it's a disease for um, one reason or another doesn't have an impact uh, as much as seen in adults. Next slide, please. Now, I'll just go through this uh, table, which is uh, provided kindly by Professor Yeo from National University of Singapore uh, and the KK Women's and Children's Hospital. It's still undergoing peer review at the moment, uh, but they, the lead author has kindly agreed to share. Uh, it actually consists of the, all the papers that have been published from China um, until the end of last month. So what's been happening is that every little, every other hospital with three, 10, 15 cases all been publishing separately. And Professor Yeo and his uh, colleagues, they uh, did almost like a systematic review and pulled the data together so we have a better idea. So this data is from China um, of uh, different sites and different hospitals. Basically, the experience shows that, um, that there are, um, um, there were 138, uh, 39 infants, some uh, from 137 women, so the two sets of twins, and mode of birth was uh, significantly higher uh, of, um, of them were born with cesarean section, as Dr. Watt, David Watson mentioned, uh, with a preterm rate of almost 27%. Just to give an idea, our preterm rate, the normal is about 6%. So one, a quarter of those babies there were born preterm um, and uh, data was, testing data was available from 121 patients and five, which is 4% were tested positive and they were all tested positive on date after the 24 hours. So there were no vertical transmission reported from the series. The, there was one stillbirth and one neonatal death, but they were both, um, tested negative. So there were no deaths from the series, um, a high percentage of prematurity, um, but this number of babies who tested positive were relatively small. Next slide, please. Yoga, before we go to that, and this is a difficult question, that there, there is a level of discomfort around some of the Chinese data. What I'm understanding from what you're saying is that these are a lot of small case reports rather than a big study that's come out centrally from China, would that be right? So this is a compilation of all the small um, studies. So th I think this paper consists of 15, 15 different studies published to date. So almost like a systematic review. So we can have a level of confidence in this data? Yes, well, I guess, um, yes, yeah, some level of confidence. They are mainly published in um, JAMA, Lancet and journals, but I guess, um, yes, um, I guess there is some level of confidence um, because I believe the colleagues from Italy, although they have not published results, also showed a relatively low um, number of deaths in neonates, but that's not been published. Thank you. Next slide, please. I've not seen any publication yet from US, but they might be in peer review and we should be seeing them um, soon. I won't go through very detail of this slide. Dr. Norton, I believe, went through an excellent presentation. Just want to highlight the importance of um, the TMPR SS2 transmembrane protein receptor enzyme, which you can see on the bottom right. Um, where it, it's needed together with the ACE receptors um, to enable the virus to enter the cell. So, and so basically it needs both the ACE receptor and TMPR SS2 uh, enzyme for the virus to enter the cell. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a interesting paper available on PLOS One of our those who entered a free open access, which, um, uh, gives a plausible explanation why we don't see vertical transmission. Again, it's still early stages and our understanding will evolve in the next few months. But if you look, they're both two graphs 
left and right both show different parts of the placental tissue. Um, but what I want to show the investigators then try to demonstrate the presence or absence of the TMPR SS2 receptors on different parts of the uh, placenta as if you can see the graph on the right. So as from the previous slide, the virus needs both the ACE2 receptor and the TMPR SS2 enzyme to enter the cells. But um, based on uh, this finding, it shows that the placenta tissue, uh, placenta fetal interface tissue um, has almost none TMPR SS2 enzymes, or they were not expressed in these enzymes. And, and this could be a reason why uh, the virus is unable to cross through vertical transmission uh, into, the, into the fetus. Um, as time goes on, we'll have more understanding, but this is a, a reason why um, the, there's no fetal infection. And so, Yoko, just to clarify, the, the slide, the, the bit of the slide that we can see on the right-hand side, which look like two green thumbprints, that, yes. that is showing us that there is no evidence well, there's some ACE2 express, but no TM, TMPS, TMPRSS2. So you need both of them for, for the virus to affect. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yes, you need both for the virus to be activated and enter the cell. So this is trying to say that, um, that the virus unable to enter the placenta then to cross over to the fetus because the absence of the TMPRSS2 um, um, enzyme. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is a pathway that uh, we are using in our clinical practice developed by um, Queensland Health in consultation with the, um, all the tertiary neonatal units of how we will manage a baby uh, being born to a mother with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19. The um, basically the baby, the neonatal team will be there at birth and resuscitation or cesarean section, and there are separate advices of what PPE to wear. But generally, general recommendation, as um, as David mentioned uh, earlier, that the team will wear full PPE with the air with airborne uh, droplet risk if they are attending a resuscitation. Now, for the baby, if a baby is born well and term and feed is feeding and does not need any resuscitation or is does not need any ongoing support or treatment the baby then stays with the mother in isolation and the recommendation is baby can breastfeed and you know and stay with mom and when mom is ready to be discharged baby can also be discharged now should we screen a well baby that the guideline has changed a few times and it possibly might change, but the current recommendation is not routine screening for a well baby. Now, if a baby is unwell, then the baby gets admitted to the neonatal unit. So we've had a designated area uh, with designated pathway and how we would manage in our setting here, they will go into the uh, negative pressure isolation room where they will be managed in incubator um, as per the care. So they will, they, babies who are unwell will, will get tested, uh, but from the, at least from the report in China, they say uh, they do not recommend very early testing because um, the, it could be negative. So unwell baby stays in the nursery, whereas um, well baby rooms in with mom and can feed. If a baby is unwell and needs admission to the unit, it's more likely from the current data is due to neonatal conditions and not likely to be COVID infection. Nevertheless, they will stay in the, in the designated area, but baby can still be given express breast milk from the mother. Now, this pathway is quite uh, informative, but again, as more evidence comes, it, it changes to uh, suit the available uh, evidence. The next slide, please. Now, our recommendation as, as per uh, many different countries is to uh, still are, are of the opinion breast milk, breastfeeding is the best option for baby, both term and preterm. And that's not changed. 
the data that we have shows this virus is not present in the breast milk um, and, and that the breast mass, breastfeeding and uh, express breast milk um, uh, when breastfeeding is not an option uh, is still the best option. This is um, a slide that I've prepared from the uh, consumer information that's again available um, on the information side uh, regarding breastfeeding. Um, you know. So as David mentioned, the path that the Gold Coast Hospital took uh, for a well baby breastfeeding is, is most likely what we will also practice here. The four different, five different tertiary units, neonatal units often link up regularly to have a consistent practice across the state. Next slide, please. Now, it, it will fall unwell babies with COVID positive mom baby will get admitted to the neonatal unit. The data shows that a lot of the babies may be born preterm, so they will get admitted to the neonatal unit. And when the mom is COVID positive, our current policy says um, the mom will, a baby will be separated till um, she's no longer uh, infectious. This is absolutely going to be a difficult time for the family um, and, 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 and that's the current arrangement we have. So we are looking at using this technology, something that we developed uh, a few years ago where a parent uh, will have a smartphone with an app where they can remotely switch on uh, a bedside camera for their baby and able to see their baby uh, anytime they wish. Uh, until they are um, out of the infectious period. Now the baby still can receive express breast milk, which can then be um, you know, given to the baby. Um, this will be a difficult time for the family, but um, we at the moment feel this is the safest option, um, not only for this baby, but other preterm babies who are in the neonatal unit and also to the neonatal team members. Next slide, please. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'm not just going to go through in detail. Again, just, Professor... Just so the audience knows, I gave Yoga a very hard time <laughs> about presenting this slide. So he assured me it was going to be brief. It's and then, uh, Yoga, we've got a few minutes and lots of questions. So, well, when you're sure. done, yeah. Now, this is again uh, courtesy of Professor T and uh, from National University of Singapore, KK Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, in this uh, uh, manuscript that's undergoing peer review, they compared the guidelines from various different countries and who authors are from different countries, just to see how practice varies or similar between various countries. Um, as you know, in Australia, the, there's, uh, every state has its own policy, whereas in some other countries, there's a national policy, um, either formally or informally. Um, most of, in summary, most countries have an approach where the infectious mother a well baby stays with the mother rooms in, um, maybe except in China and I think in Singapore where um, they are they're not roomed in together. Um, again, for breast milk, breastfeeding policy, um, most of the guidelines across the country will recommend babies continue to receive breast milk, breastfeeding, except I think in one or two countries where they are formula fed. Um, I wouldn't comment why that is, it's something they decide locally. Um, in, in most places, um, when, when, we, uh, when linking up with colleagues from Italy, when the hospital system is uh, overwhelmed by sick patients, um, the babies, well babies will stay with mom and they get discharged home because um, it is just not possible to have a well baby nursery um, with COVID negative babies um, separated from ill mothers. So the approach that's taken is babies, well babies stay with mom and continue breastfeeding and they go home and stay in the community with arrangement done of um, how to get them assessed um, uh, with um, uh, and a strategy put in place for that. Thank you, Yoga. So Dave and Yoga, there are a few questions and just a couple of minutes to go and no particular order. Um, we have a midwife, a few, several midwives online, and, and one is asking she, that she's read work instructions stating to wash the mother's chest before skin to skin in a positive or suspe suspected woman. And she's wondering whether there's any evidence base to this 
that either of you know. Dave, if you're going to answer this, you are on mute. I have not read that. I guess it would potentially make sense, but I have not actually read that. All right, thank you. Uh, next one, and this may well go more to yoga at this point. Um, someone said there's a published article stating that a 16 hour old preterm tested positive, but IgG and IgM were negative. Now, I don't know if you've seen that article, but everything I have read so far about serology is that it's very unreliable. So I don't know, Yoga, if you have a comment on that. I've not seen the exact timing, but, but just saying on this and I go, um, but definitely, yes, um, some of the centers in China have used serology um, to test IgM uh, to diagnose uh, a baby with COVID. So um, the, there is a, um, like a, a comment in JAMA which says um, concerns about using IgM uh, to detect COVID and the false positive associated with this. Um, so um, yes, there, um, there are uh, babies diagnosed with um, using serology, uh, but there's um, a question about accuracy of this uh, test. Thank you. Dave, one quick one for you. Are you aware of any contraindications for FSC of scalp blood, uh, scalp blood sampling in a, in a positive mom? No, I'm not. Um, I think it's, uh, again, the mothers are not typically viremic. The vaginal secretions are said uh, unlikely to contain uh, virus. I think we would do that. Thank you. And someone very helpfully has just posted to say, Queensland Clinical Guidelines states no evidence to support washing on maternal or baby skin before initial contact or breastfeeding. So that was really useful. And um, I think that's probably where we're going to leave it. It's, it's nearly eight o'clock. I want to thank you both so very much. And we could obviously go on for hours and hours. If we could just have the last slide up, Pamela, just to let people know about um, we're getting a complete turn and we're going to look at pets and COVID. So can your cat give you COVID or can you give your, the cat COVID or dog? <laughs> and we've got uh, our veterinary school coming in to spend some time with us. Thank you again so much, both of you and everyone who's been online, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.